So I believed, for example, I was in the Truman Show and I was on the street and everyone in the street was, in, was on the Truman Show as well. And I was being watched and I, I literally, yeah, I had a meltdown. But I've been lucky though, in terms of particularly my family and friends, they've all been really supportive, really supportive. Um, and not everyone has that support. So, you know, I, yeah. I do feel really, really, really fortunate, really fortunate. Oh, that's amazing. That does. That's definitely. I mean, modern times definitely help a little bit. I mean, I went and did a. I did a film in Argentina about an exorcist, um, and basically the majority of his patients were people dealing with with things reminiscent of of schizophrenia. Mm. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I couldn't diagnose them. Although some of them had been in psychiatric wards, and he was going around sort of taking them out of psychiatric wards and telling them they have a demon. So what you just said before really, it, it really chimed with me because uh, about there being no quick fix, because yeah. I think a lot of them were expecting one. And, oh. and unfortunately the symptoms, a lot of symptoms of schizophrenia are very similar to what you might imagine a demon being and a, a demon voice and a demon uh, urges and pushes and these kinds of things. So it's very easy for them to fall into that narrative of like, oh, it must be a devil and there's going to be a quick fix. And I think they were so willing to believe it that all of these people I interviewed, who I, I watched them go through exorcisms, which was a horrific thing to watch. It's like, it's it's one of the worst things I've ever seen to be in a room with. Mm. And then afterwards, they they all said they were much better. But then you go back in six months or a year and it it goes away again. I mean, could you, could you see how, from your own experience, can you see how that, if you had less knowledge, I suppose, about what it actually is, how that might work for you temporarily as well? Yeah, well... I mean, to be honest, I had a similar experience when I went to India. Uh, I went to do some work there, mental health work, uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, we went to some kind of a few different like temples um, and we saw this, wow, kind of what, like what you were saying. I mean, the, the, uh, the noises that I heard coming out of people's mouths, the kind of... Um, it still haunt, haunts me the yeah and and the way they yeah. were i don't know shaking and uh yeah. it was yeah it was, it was really disturbing to be honest um I, yeah i still remember it really really well um and 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 you know seeing people shackled and and chained up but again not everyone has access to the type of therapy that that i've had um no. i've had a lot of different types of therapy and um again as we were saying there's a lot of work to do worldwide in terms of mental health you know increasing understanding and reducing stigma and yeah a lot of work to do a lot of work because i i think I, I understand that you for some time didn't want to tell even doctors or anything about voices you were hearing and that kind of thing and is, is that was that related to the stigma or related to the illness itself that was making you not want to say anything uh no I, i'd say i was embarrassed embarrassed and embarrassed and ashamed and confused and um uh, on the outside everything looked good you know, for me, um, I was a teenager and um, I was doing really well at school. I had good prospects. I was going to go to university. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to fit in and for everyone to think that I was normal in inverted commas. I didn't dare say anything to... Uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, when I look back, I think a lot of it stems from my, my faith and my religion. And um, I don't know, I, I felt that what I was experiencing was, was related to my, my faith. Um, so yeah, grew, you know, grew up, grew up Jewish in the Jewish family, yep. Jewish school. I believed that there was, or I had some link or connection to, to God or to, yeah, to God really. And I believed that I was being punished when I, you know, was experiencing these voices that were telling me to do things. So I didn't tell anyone. I just sort of gone with it, which was really hard. What you've been diagnosed with is, is it schizoaffective disorder? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. It, is that, and are things like that? I, I know, I know nothing about anything, right? So is that on a sort of spectrum that everyone has a bit of it and it goes up and if you have too much of it, or is it just, it's, it's an illness that you either have or you don't. I only ask because I think a lot of the things you're saying I can relate to on a very minor level in that I also ran around as a five-year-old or 10-year-old or a bit old, you know, thinking that maybe a voice was talking to me. But I think a lot of people would relate to hearing some sort of a voice in their mind. A lot of people might, I find myself talking to myself in the day, maybe repeating arguments that I wanted to have with someone I didn't say the right thing. Are these totally separate things or are, or is it a spectrum? I think it's a spectrum. I think it's a spectrum. Mm. Um, but I mean, obviously there's the really extreme end, you know, when, when you're 
diagnosed with something like schizophrenia or schizoaffective. Um, but I do think, yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people actually have done quite a bit of research and a lot of people do hear voices that don't have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar or schizoaffective. Um, mm. There's been a lot of research actually done into people that are just living with, with, with voices and they are just functioning and, you know, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's such an interesting one. Um, cause there's so many strong, different viewpoints on this. You know, if you talk to a psychiatrist, um, they'd probably say, well, that person has schizophrenia or psychosis, <laughs> but you know, um, the person themselves might not want to label what they have as schizophrenia or psychosis. It might be, um, a spiritual experience or, you know, um, I just think, yeah, there's so many different varying opinions and we have to be mindful to them all, uh, be open-minded. I think often, um, from my experience talking to psychiatrists in general, you know, it, it, mm, I've had quite, yeah, um, some challenging experiences with psychiatrists who are very much focused on the medication. We need to get rid of all these experiences and not even explore them, just get rid of them. But often, you know, often when you are hearing a voice, it's there's something underneath it is maybe it comes from trauma often, mm. you know, and it needs to be explored. But some some people just don't want to go there. They just want to get rid of whatever it is. And um, again, medication, pharmaceutical industry is such a big topic, isn't it? Um, and one that is... Uh, of course, it's such a, you know, I've had or well, been in so many different arguments and debates about medication and diagnosis and um, uh, pharmaceutical companies is such a big topic. And again, I just, I wish people could be more open-minded about this whole conversation and actually have a mm. dialogue rather than um, closed-mindedness, narrow-mindedness on, on this subject. What, what's your stance? I've really explored the world of, mental health and you know i've come across so many different like movements there's like the um hearing voices network for example or the emerging proud network who are very much coming from it as a spiritual experience i think over the years actually i've moved more away from traditional psychiatry i mean when i was um 20 i've got i got this diagnosis of schizoaffective and when i was given my diagnosis there wasn't much hope hope or there wasn't I don't know I was just told you've got this illness and this is the medication and <laughs> good luck basically you know uh there really wasn't um, I don't know I didn't know where to go I didn't know what to what to do with this um and yeah over the years I've yeah explored different different avenues um I think what's really helped me is um, the type of therapy that I have at the moment, which is called um, CFT, which is compassion focused therapy. Well, it's, it's very much focused on um, compassion for the self, compassion for the mind. And it's really useful, particularly, I think, if you hear voices and the voices are negative and destructive, um, CFT can be really, really helpful. And it's much more, CFT is much more about, yeah, exploring the experience rather than labeling it and, and putting the diagnosis on it and um trying to get rid of it with strong antipsychotic medication and that's the thing right. i think that's the big thing is the treatment the medication the antipsychotic medication particularly for schizophrenia bipolar it it's really tough um mm. that medication i've been on different types of medication oh. the side effects that they, they have really like in a, a beautiful mind the movie mm. absolutely yeah he sort of ends up going off of them again because he finds it completely dullens him. Is that a word? Dullen? <laughs> Numbs? It is now. <laughs> it sounds like it should be a word, doesn't it? Dullen? It does, yeah. But but yes, he goes off of them and he sees the he sees people again, but then I think he sort of just learns to live with them there. Yeah. Is that a possibility? Would that be a possibility for you? Or Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, I am on medication, actually. I am on medication, but mm. um, again, over the years, I've sort of, learned to learn to um take the right doses that work for me because i've ended up where i'm i'm literally numb there's no feeling yeah. or 
no, I'm, I'm I'm a creative I'm a creative person, and the creativity is gone. The, it's like it just all shuts down, and it's yeah. horrible when you know you're creative and that part of you is just gone. So um, yeah, I've I've over the years again, I, I've I've had different psychiatrists, and you know, again, I've I'm now lucky that I've got a psychiatrist who is more open minded, and I think that's that's really helped because um, mm. it's 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 so tough. Uh, the medication and I don't think people talk no. about that enough the side effects and uh, the challenge of, of of taking medication and staying on it so many people particularly with schizophrenia bipolar will go on and off and on and off the medication because of the side effects and no one really talks about it and that is that sort of deadening I suppose if if the voices obviously the voices are not, are not real and they're part of your imagination so I suppose there's no way of isolating just the voices so they must be having to that's what they do they they dampen your your creative sensibilities which is and I, so this, the thing is that there is a link between schizophrenia and creativity we know there's a link for sure i mean uh so many artists uh throughout the centuries have had well maybe not schizophrenia but psychosis actually psychosis or what does psychosis mean in its most sort of fundamental uh, description so i'd say that psychosis is um kind of state of mind where you are you're not in reality um so maybe you're hearing voices or experiencing um delusions but you are it's it's, it's not a nice place i've been psychotic uh a few times oh so they're moments it's not like you don't live with it it's like different moments where it might happen suddenly for me it's been thankfully it's been moments but for some people it is more enduring psychosis and that i just yeah, it must be so tough. I'm lucky that um, my psychotic moments, I mean, they were really, so I believed, uh, for example, I was in the Truman Show and I was on the street and everyone in the street was in, was on the Truman Show as well and I was being watched and I, I literally, yeah, I had a meltdown. It was horrible. Um, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't rooted in reality at all. And um, thankfully, I eventually got out of that delusion and that psychosis they <laughs> gave me loads of sleeping pills and kind of oh. slept it slept it off kind of um oh my word but i know for some people you know psychosis can last for a longer period and that is tough yeah okay so is it a case that there is i'm just trying to get my my sort of head in that space uh is it a case that like there's a part of you that knows deep, like, like with, I had somebody who had very strong OCD and mm. he was saying that he knows this part of him knows that a lot of this isn't true, but he sort of feels compelled to do it. Is that the case? Or did you really, really feel sure that you were in the Truman show? Yeah, I did. Particularly uh, this particular episode I had, I was a hundred percent convinced I was in the Truman mm. show and everyone around me was an actor. And the thing was, <laughs> what made it worse is that the more that I, acted up on the street or, or acted out on the street and we was started to get so aggravated the more people stopped and stared uh, and took yeah. videos and the more i then that fueled my belief i'm on the truman show everyone's an actor everyone's watching me so that was a really horrible horrible experience i was i was with a my colleague a, a good friend and you know yeah. no matter what he said to me i was like you're an actor just you know i did it, didn't matter what he said, what he did. Uh, my mind was completely um, in that delusion. Wow. How did he respond to that? He was brilliant, actually. I mean, he he was obviously, you know, um, kind of disturbed. and um, But he, he, he was very, like, he let me have my sort of... He didn't try too much to shut me down or, 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 or stop me. and Because I think that would have made me worse. I would have been like, no, you you know there was nothing he could do so he just he stayed with me and he was really yeah patient and eventually he managed to convince me to go to hospital he had to wait a long time and he was really as i said really patient really mm -hmm. patient with me he let me be he let me be right yeah do you ever have moments now where you will lose that moment that sort of string of reality and and suddenly think am i in actually maybe i am in the truman show or, or anything like that yeah but not to not to that extent where i was you know, 100% convinced. There'll be moments where, um, for example, I'm I'm thinking about someone and they are there on the street 
Um, it's happened a few times and, and, you know, I live in London and this is like millions and millions of people in London and the person I'm thinking about is suddenly there and I'm like, and I'll say to my therapist, you know, I, I really, I'm really thinking that I'm, I'm actually on the Truman Show because yeah. of this incident. And the good thing is, you know, he'll try and sort of, yeah, ground me back to, to reality. Yeah, he's really, he's really good. He's really good at that. Oh, it's, it's it's really extraordinary. It's fascinating. You know, thank you for giving me an, uh, us an insight into your That's mind. Cool. Could you tell me about Fine Mike and and what led up to that? The, the sort of the moments leading up to that. Yeah. So that was that was when I was given my diagnosis. Um, and as I said, I was <laughs> it was given no hope. Um, I was put into this psychiatric hospital, and I was put onto this um, what they called the suicide ward. Mm. Um, which basically is where people come and sit and watch you um, 24-7. And, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're like paranoid already, then having people just sit and watch you, and even when you go to the toilet. Jesus. It's not exactly, I don't know. I, I basically, uh, I, I was put into this hospital and I stayed there in there for a month before I gave up. Um, I just couldn't, I just couldn't see a way forwards. There was really no hope as I, as I said. And so I made, um, uh, an escape from, from the hospital, um, which kind of wasn't that hard. I said I needed a cigarette and they let me out and I basically ran away. Um, and I, I ended up on, on a bridge on the edge of a bridge, um, and, you know, really fortunately for me, I wasn't on there long at all when this stranger walked past and, um, stranger came and stood next to me and, um, we had this chat. Um, he got me to really sort of open up and, um, that hadn't happened before. I hadn't opened up before, but, um, I don't know, I felt really safe and sort of uh yeah safe with this stranger and connected to him and um you know it was so different to the hospital where I was just watched and people wouldn't talk they just watch but this guy was really um he really wanted to to understand and to sort of help and to to talk to me and so yeah he eventually eventually managed to um convince me to come away from the edge of the bridge was this o over a motorway no a river it was over a river were you thinking i'm gonna jump in, in the river yeah 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 i uh as i said i had enough i had enough um hmm. it really it felt like the end you know it really there wasn't there wasn't a way forward. I didn't see a way forward. Uh, I was, I just saw myself being ill for the rest of my life and a, a burden on, on particularly my, my family, you know? So yeah, he, he, this stranger, um, managed to talk me off the edge. And, um, when he, when he talked me off the edge, the police were waiting for me. I, I didn't know what was going on sort of behind me, uh, away from me, but the police, uh, quickly kind of ran into the scene and, um, it got, uh, it got a bit, um, got a bit frantic. Uh, I was handcuffed and I was taken away. Um, and then, yeah, me and the stranger, we, uh, separated at that point. Um, he was told to go one way and I was taken to, to the local hospital and I was sectioned. But, you know, that conversation had a real impact on me. This stranger and his kindness and his, um, he was so positive. You know, he was just, you know, he said to me, you'll get, you, you'll be all right. You'll get better. And, um, hmm. sounds very simple, but the words had a, a huge impact on me um and 
so w- so when I was in a better place, um, I decided to to try and find him, to thank him for for what he'd done, um, and launch this find Mike search to to try and track him down to yeah. to say thank you for for what he did. To be, I didn't think we were gonna find him because you know um, he could be anywhere. But we launched the campaign to raise awareness of, of mental health and particularly suicide. Yeah. Um, cause suicide is, is, it's, it's a, it's a really difficult subject to, to address. And, you know, the, the statistics are shocking. It's, um, every 40 seconds, someone kills themselves around the world. It's shocking. So we wanted to raise awareness, um, yeah. and get people talking. It really sort of captured people's imaginations. It really got to people in a way that I think most campaigns haven't done. I mean, it was David Cameron was, was, uh, you know, getting involved in the Stephen Fry and people like that. What do you think it was that sort of got uh, the, the Royals, I think, were they getting into it? They did eventually, yeah, they did. Um, I think it was a story of connection, human connection, uh, a story of, of hope. Well, mm. lots of people kind of ask themselves, would I be able to do what that stranger did? I launched it in, in, a, in the middle of January, you know, in the middle of winter and it's January is often full of quite bleak news and difficult times. So I guess it was a story, an uplifting story of, of hope, I think. That's that's maybe why it captured people's attention. I mean, are people approaching you all the time as, as you've become sort of a, a poster for, for I don't want to say poster boy because it sounds ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know, what are people, a poster person mm-hmm. for uh, for mental health? Um, you know, and, and so do people come to you for advice and help a lot? Yeah, they do. They do. I feel lucky that I can impart some, hopefully, wisdom and, and signpost them in the right directions. Because often people just don't know where to, to start. They don't know where, where, to, where to go. And I get a lot of people contact me for advice on, on family and friends. You know, they can't get through to a family member or friend that's so common um Hmm. because you know again the stigma stigma it still very much exists what should somebody do if if, say their their child like like you for example 10 years old and they're they're going through what you were going through what what kind of family member do or a parent well i mean i'm making it sound simple but 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 talk you know um don't be afraid to to really broach the subject i mean you know there's so much out there now in terms of um stuff online about mental health, people, celebrities talking about mental health all the time, which is great because you can kind of use that. Um, Books, TV programs. um, Yeah. Use that when you're talking to your child about, you know, how they're, how they're feeling. Um, But the key is not to, not to ignore it just as you would, if it was a physical health issue, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that someone was experiencing, you wouldn't, you know, when I was first on well, people would be like, they'd sit me down and they'd say, Johnny, you need to talk. You need to open up. I kind of withdrew because it was too intense and formal and to know. So, so talking to someone in a very sort of just, you know, human sort of way um, and not making it too, too big a deal. And it can take time to sort of, you know, really get someone to open up. I think that's the key. Don't, don't give up. Don't give up. Does it weigh on you to, to sort of have this responsibility sometimes? It, it did. It did at points, actually. Um, yeah, it, it did. Particularly, you know, um, well, for example, there was one message that I got. Yeah, this was years ago, and someone said, um, "Can you call me on my cell phone? I'm, I'm going to jump out a, a window in in Manhattan, in, in New York." <gasps> Yeah, that was uh, a big shock. And, um, you know, I tried to kind of talk them around or, or I, I signposted them to their nearest places in New York, in Manhattan, where they were to, to, to go and get help and, and support. I don't know. I just, I, you know, I said to myself, well, you know, luckily I saw that message, but if I hadn't seen that message. Um, Did you hear anything later from that person? No, no. Um I think I would worry that it were a troll or something. Yeah, there's that too. There is that too, for sure. You just don't know. Um, I mean, again, that's, you know, I'm always trying to signpost people to their nearest places to go for, for help and support. Um, Cause that's the best thing when, when someone um, is in, is in distress in crisis to go somewhere safe, somewhere local to them 
Uh, but often people don't know where to go. That's the thing. I've got a um, patron thing, right, where people, you know, subscribe to the podcast. And one of the things that uh, in one of the tiers that they can ask a question, whoever's the first one, I tell them who I've got on or whatever. So I've got one for you mm. from uh, somebody called Kane. Mm -hmm. and he said, hi, Andrew, thank you for letting me come on the show. First of all, just wanted to say hello to my lovely mother, Deborah, who I know is a huge fan of yours and will be listening. This is for Johnny. I was wondering if the clinical manifestations of schizophrenia were different um, as a child compared to as an adult. Yeah, as a child, everything is, uh, I think everything is much scarier, you know, certainly for me. Um, I remember experiencing a lot of fear. My parents took me to a psychologist when I was five because I'd experienced, um, well, I thought that <laughs> at nighttime there were, there was something out to get me and it came into the house and I heard the footsteps and they weren't really there, but you know, I then wouldn't sleep in my, in my own bed and I'd only sleep with my parents. And uh, I was really scared for so much of the, the time. And, you know, as a child, it's hard to communicate that. And, you know, whereas an adult, I, as an adult now I have language, I have the language to express when I'm, and I have tools that I, I can use, you know, if I'm overwhelmed and, and, in a state of distress, but as a child, you know, um, and people around me didn't know how to deal with it and handle it. And yeah, it was really scary and tough. I don't think we take childhood's mental health issues seriously enough. Mm. Um, we know that a lot of mental health issues start in childhood, but yeah, I just don't think we, 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 we deal with it properly. Um, and this is why actually I set the charity up that I've got to, to really try and focus on what we call um, early intervention, you know, getting in there hmm. young rather than, you know, so many people, they, they, they wait and they wait and they wait for a diagnosis and for treatment. But if we get in there young, we can make a big difference. Um, so we're all about getting into schools early and we've got a, a mental health festival for schools actually in February, which, um, it's all about getting getting to to young people and to teachers and to families early on. I suppose it's really difficult because no parent wants to admit to themselves the reality of the situation. No, of course, of course. But there is help and support for parents, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, absolutely, parents. Um, I mean, my parents found it really isolating and hard, you know. Um, I, they didn't know who to talk to. Um, mm about my my mental health issues um so so to be honest at first they didn't talk to anyone and that's really hard because again if you think of something like um you know cancer when someone has has cancer and you know the family will hopefully rally around and you'll have friends around and there's a lot of support but again with mental health because of the stigma you know there's that support is is um harder sometimes to, to get um mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough. And you spoke before of part of the, the difficulty being coming from a fair, was it a fairly religious Jewish upbringing? Because because many Jewish families in North London, for example, are, are very secular. But did you find was yours quite religious then? I'd say it was moderate. It was moderate. Um, mm. I mean, I went to <laughs> I went to Sunday school. Me too. <laughs> What's that? You too? Yeah, yeah. Learn to read Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I to be honest, Sunday school. I found it strange looking back, uh, all the different things we were told about, you know, God. And I remember some teachers really tried to sort of, um, sort of drive fear into you or into me. Um, yeah, yeah I found it a strange experience Sunday school. I don't know about I wonder you. If, if it was the same one, where was yours? <laughs> Mine was, um, E EDRS? Oh, uh, I played football for EDRS. Ah, okay. <laughs> Where was your Sunday school? This is going to sound so weird to people listening who don't know it. These, these strange <laughs> things we were going to on Sundays. when Absolutely. Uh, mine was called Cole High, which is Hatch End. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a strange thing we did. Um, yeah. But yeah, so was, was yours, was it at the point, let's say, were, were you kosher at home? No, it wasn't to that, not okay. to that extent. No. 
Okay, because I've also I've heard you talk about that. It you know as well as it being more difficult, maybe with your illness, it was also difficult to come out as a gay man. Yeah. So that that made me think it was a fairly religious, a conservative upbringing. Maybe is that is that the case? Conservative, yeah, conservative for sure. Again, homosexuality, like mental illness, was just not talked about. It was it was a taboo. It was such a taboo um, at home and in school and. Um, so yeah, so so it was another sort of um, thing for me to to hide, you know, because um, again I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, worried about what people would think. That's so sad. Mm. Yeah, it, it is, and I still know people that go through it, you know. Even though I think there's more acceptance and tolerance, it, I think it's harder in religious communities, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I still know people that, that, that really struggle to, to come out to parents, to families. Um, mm. and it's a shame in this day and age, but it still happens. How was in the end coming at when, when, when was that for you? And how was that with your family? So I did that when I was, uh, 20, 21, I think. So it was after I got diagnosed, I was ill, um, and um, I actually found it harder, I think, to come out uh, as gay rather than come out about my mental health issues. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I found it tricky, particularly talking to my parents about it, my, my extended family. Um, but I mean, you know, again, I'm really lucky. I, I've never had any rejection because of it. You know, I know people that have had rejection from religious mm. family members um the really dreadful you know rejection and being thrown out of home and gosh it, so i feel really lucky that i didn't experience any of that for sure um but it was still it was still tricky it was tough and 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 how is it now i mean are you uh do do you if you don't mind me asking do you live with somebody now and and how do, okay and how would they or how have relationships worked with your condition yeah, I've not not had much luck on that sort of front, to be honest. The paranoia alone. I mean, paranoia ruins most relationships. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. No, it's been it's been tricky. Uh, a few people that that I've kind of been with just haven't really grasped it or understood. Or like, I remember I was seeing I was seeing one guy and I, I had a panic attack in front of him, mm -hmm. um, and he just laughed and he was like you're being ridiculous what are you doing having a panic attack for and mm. that was the end of our <laughs> kind of uh relationship after that yeah there's a lot of uh i don't know yeah again lack of um acceptance and i think it's really hard dating when you have a a, a mental health issue um yeah particularly i think in the gay community there's a lot of judgment a lot of kind of superficiality there seems to be from the outside. I have no idea, but there seems to be a. Is, is there a sort of pursuit of perfection in the mm, gay community? Definitely, definitely, yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. So it's a big problem in the community, and there's a lot of problems with addiction as a result. Mm. Mental health issues, suicide is is a much higher in the LGBT mm. plus community. Yeah, it, it, all of those things, mental health issues, things like depression, are higher addiction rates are higher and suicide rates are higher. So, and again, I think it's not something that's addressed enough within. But life is so, it's so much more interesting when people are imperfect, aren't they? And they're sort of funny and they have different things and they have their weaknesses and their strengths. You know, one of my favorite people is, uh, or celebrities is Simon Amstel, right? And uh, he's just yeah. a perfect example of that because yeah. he admits his problems and his, yeah. uh, and that's how I'd like to think if I were gay, he's the kind of guy I would go for. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure, a hundred percent. Yeah, I just think, yeah. um, but it's hard, people like that are hard to find in the community. Um, you know, if you go on a dating app, it's it's all about what you look like and yeah. having the perfect, yeah. perfect um, body and face, and um, oh, so much of it is yeah, it's about appearance. Yeah. So much of it is about appearance. Well, that's also dating apps, isn't it? You've got, mm. you got to meet someone for a friend, I think, whether you're straight or gay, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's awful, the dating apps and the, you know, 
because I had that, you know, my, my girlfriend, I was struggling so hard to, to meet someone. It was six years ago now we've been together. Oh. And it, I found a similar thing in terms of everyone I met was just so like ridiculous. Like every photo was just like breasts everywhere. <laughs> and like, mm. just like, how am I going to like, introduce this person to my parents no that shouldn't be the first thing i think but <laughs> you know how am i gonna uh, have a conversation with this but and i was fortunate enough that a friend of a friend knew somebody and was like oh you two should whatever okay. and that's that's how it's got to be i think doesn't it yeah i i i've kind of given up with the dating apps for now i think I told you before my, my stepmom does find you very 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 <laughs> handsome well i mean uh <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, uh, yeah, she's she's not gay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Um, I was watching something before. Do you have you heard of Ellen Sachs? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I was watching her uh, talk, and she said some really interesting things. And one of the things was, I, I wanted to go through a couple of the things and see if you relate to them. And so one is like, imagine having a nightmare while you're awake. Is that how schizo schizoaffective disorder feels to you? When when I'm in an episode. Yeah, wow. for sure. When I, when I'm, I mean, day to day, thankfully, no, thankfully, because mm. I wouldn't be able to function if it if it was like that every day. But yeah, when I'm um, unwell and having an episode, then yeah, I mean, it's um, I wouldn't wish it on, you know, worst enemy. You know, um, it's horrible to be yeah to feel kind of trapped by your mind and you're at the mercy of it. It's, it's horrible. Another thing that really struck me that she said, I'd never given this that much thought, and that's probably an oversight on my part, but when you see people on the street shouting and stuff, they're likely to be going through a schizophrenic episode or something. Uh, whereas I'd always assumed, as she points out, you assume they're drunk on drugs mm. and this and that, and it, it could be that, and, and except that they don't have access to the right mental health care and stuff. Do you know, I was in New York actually, um, I can't remember about a year ago. And I mean, gosh, I was really struck. I've been to New York a few times, but in this particular time, I was really struck by how many unwell people there were on the, on the streets, in the parks, mm -hmm. uh, really unwell. Yeah. You know, a, a city like, and I know it's not just New York, obviously. I mean, I mean, we know that Berlin where I am really 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 yeah a lot a of, lot of people a lot more than i noticed in london for example so interesting i mean it's really horrific it's really it's really sad um but yeah the i mean a lot of a lot of unwell people um and yeah they don't have access to to anything let alone mental health care and if they just got the right you know maybe treatment mm. uh things could be different but it makes me re that makes me really really sad and angry as well man it's, we've got such a long way to go mm. it sounds like um and that's why it's so important the work you do um one other thing she said which i just liked because it sounds so poetic but she doesn't actually agree with the sentiment which was which was something i often ask people when they are going through things and they say like if you could get rid of it all they often surprise you and say, no, I wouldn't. And that, that was the case with a, a psychopath I spoke to. It was the case with uh, a non-offending paedophile I spoke to one time who said, would that really surprise me when they were just like, no, because that's my identity and I, I don't know what it's like to not be me. Wow. She, and she used this quote that somebody had used saying, don't take my devils away because my angels may flee too, which I thought was a beautiful quote. But then she said, it doesn't apply to me at all. I would get rid of this in a second if I could. And wow. where do you stand on that? Gosh, that just gave me shivers. Um, it's a beautiful line, isn't it? Do you know what, though? I mean, it depends. I know this is going to... It depends on where I am, the day that I'm having, or the, the week, or the month, or the year. I mean, um, it's, it's a difficult one because, uh, you know, I think for me, I've got uh, a lot of... Um, it, this this whole journey has helped develop my things like um, uh, empathy and um, my insight and my creativity, you know. Um, uh, but at the same time, I do sometimes just look at people. I look at people that just are, are able to just roll out of bed in the morning and just 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 plow through their day without. Yeah. Yeah paranoia or anxiety or and all the work that you know i and it's it, the thing is it's for me i realize now 
it's 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 constant work it's constant um you know i've been in therapy for years and um i'm constantly having to work on things and yeah for some days i do just yeah wish that mm. uh it, it, i could just have it all taken away um but as i said on other days when you know i'm really creative then i think no or, or days when i'm able to be really happy and you know enjoy life it sounds like it's so wrapped up in in any sort of creativity and personality and maybe it's even I even had that answer for, uh, a couple of weeks ago. A, a woman who went blind. Uh, she's the BBC Radio One's first blind presenter, Lucy Edwards. She's mm. she's just great to listen to. She's fantastic, and she went blind when she was t- about twenty or nineteen. Just uh, an operation went wrong, and she woke up and couldn't see. Oh my gosh, awful! And even she said, "I wouldn't change it now. At first, I would have. It's now been six or seven years, and this is sort of who I am." Which, which is hard to know how much she, she has to sort of tell herself that to keep going and how much she really means it figuratively. And, but maybe I'm, I'm being unfair and she really, really does mean that. Sure. I think it's extraordinary. I think it really is extraordinary. I mean, the thing, I think for me, acceptance has been a big part of this. I spent years trying to fight it and uh, in, in denial. And, but I think, yeah, over the years, learning to... Um, Except that my mind, my brain, uh, I did some work with um, Yale and uh, I mean, they're, all the work they're doing into particularly psychosis and schizophrenia is so fascinating and looking into the brain. And I don't know, for me, that really helped, you know, looking into my brain, thinking of this as a, you know, as a chemical imbalance. It's not my fault. Is that what it is as far as the, the scientists today know? Is that, is that it's a chemical, it's not a physical thing? Well, that is a physical thing, isn't it, chemicals? Well, actually, to be honest, when I was at Yale uh, a couple of years ago, they found that um, there's a particular nerve in the brain. And if that nerve is shorter in, in people, they will hear a voice. Uh, they will have auditory hallucinations. Wow. Are you hearing that voice from... <laughs> Again, one of the things this exorcist said, which made no sense at all, but he said, well, to me anyway, was... Because I said, "What about people who have schizophrenia?" And he—he was—he wasn't a great, a nice guy. This guy, he, I was ex- sort of trying to expose what he was doing, but he—he he said, "Oh well, you know, when they hear voices from the outside, then it's schizophrenia. But when they're from the inside, it's demonic possession or something like that." Does it feel like someone's in the room, or is it your mind is saying stuff? To be honest, I'm really lucky that um, nowadays I rarely hear the voice um really lucky i know i'm really wow. lucky whereas when i was um in my late teens yeah it was there it was with me it was talking to me um telling me oh god telling me you know you've got to do this you've got to say these three words and if you don't say these three words then you know i'm gonna punish your mom i'm gonna punish your dad i called it shush shush i mean obviously physically it wasn't there but as an auditory hallucination it was there but for me yeah, it was it was a it was a, it was a devil it was um this thing that that had come down to to punish me and um um and that was really 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 tough to mm. have to constantly live with so so is schizophrenia different to schizoaffective disorder mm. so schizoaffective disorder is uh more of a combination of of schizophrenia and a mood disorder uh-huh. so uh whereas just like pure schizophrenia um doesn't come with such sort of pronounced mood disorder it's the it's the paranoia and the hallucinations and everything but the mood isn't affected so much and is this just a movie trope because the movies it will be a totally different personality takes over the person and the person won't have any memory of the time that they became that other person do you know what i mean in those movies and stuff Mm, mm, mm. is that just Mm. science fiction yeah oh my gosh i mean um i remember and i to be honest, I, I don't go back into it because it's just too traumatic. But I remember my, um, you know, my episodes and, you know, um, yeah, I, I remember them. And I can, if I wanted to, I could really go back there and, you know, go in, not go into that state, but I could really go back there. So it's not like, and it's not like someone comes and takes over you. It's just... Um, and it's, it's not a sudden thing either. It's, um, you know, there's a build-up. I don't just suddenly 
switch, you know, there, there's always, always, always a, a build up for me, for me, uh, things like lack of sleep. Like if I don't, if I have, if I have, um, several nights of insomnia, yeah. then yeah, my mind is deteriorates. Or if, you know, I've had, a uh, if I've been drinking too much at night, uh, you know, th that's another kind of trigger. It's not just like suddenly switch. Well, for me, yeah. I don't know if other people, but for me, I, I definitely not just a sudden switch. It's a, it's a build up. It's yeah. a gradual build up. Cause yeah, I think the Hollywood version is a little bit like somebody could go and murder someone and then come back and they're in their bed and they're like, mm. well, I didn't do it. I don't remember that. And, oh, yeah. I know. I, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Uh, that's definitely not my experience for sure. When it comes to things like schizophrenia, they, you know, for some people they do recover, they do have an episode and then they recover. And I think people don't realize that obviously for some people it's, it's much more severe and it's very, really tough. Um, but it's, it, you know, as you were saying before about it being a spectrum, it's, it, it, it varies, it varies. And, you know, people have such unique experiences. Um, I mean, I've met people that hear multiple, multiple voices. Each, each, each voice is a different character and it's horrifying. Well, it is, but the amazing thing is, is that some people have learned to deal with it and live with it. And I think that's amazing because I don't think I could, to be honest. Uh, you know, one voice is bad enough, but to have multiple, I don't know, it's really inspiring to, to you know, talk to people that have multiple voices and that are, yeah. that are doing okay with them. Too often, you know, people are put in, try, put, put in boxes or they, they try to put people in boxes just because you've got schizophrenia, you know, you must have this, you must... You know, there's there's an amazing TED talk actually on on schizophrenia by someone called Eleanor Longdon, and she it's called the Voices in My Head, and um, it's amazing hearing her story. She was about to drill a hole in her head when she was a teenager because she oh. it was just too intense, and but she's learned to manage her schizophrenia and live with it. And I actually met her; it's just amazing. She's she's now um, a researcher, and she's you know academically she's done amazingly uh, in spite of well kind of similar to you know in in the film a beautiful mind john nash he you know in spite of his schizophrenia he's he did amazing things i love that film so much yeah i do as well i do <laughs> i do yeah um i just don't think we hear enough positive stories of you know um people living with something like schizophrenia mm. or people that have had psychosis you don't hear enough success stories yeah. positive stories there are there are positive stories out there that you tend to hear about you know just last week in the news in in the uk there was this story of someone with schizophrenia who had stabbed someone in a park it was all over the news um and that's often the only time you hear about schizophrenia which is really yeah frustrating i suppose when you hear about that kind of thing is there is there a tiny part of you that can relate or at least put yourself in the place where that person was and they're hearing a voice presumably saying you've got to do this right now see mine was never that extreme as to as to as to hurt someone i mean and that's the thing people with schizophrenia are more likely to be the victims of th this is the stats this is the evidence they're more likely to be yeah. victims of violence rather than actually perpetrators um i know so many people with schizophrenia who are incredibly uh, they wouldn't hurt a fly. That's the thing. And it really annoys me when, and some, and, you know, sometimes I do wonder if when it comes to courts, if uh, something like schizophrenia is maybe, um, I don't know, exaggerated or um, I don't know, but that's quite a controversial thing, but. Don't, well, don't shy away from it. Let's hear the controversial thing. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I do just wonder if, um, yeah. You know, to to stop someone from getting a lengthy sentence. The mental illness thing. Well, particularly and particularly schizophrenia, particularly, you know, if I think of all the times, you know, I've I've looked at the BBC News website and I've seen the term schizophrenia in the last few years, it's all or nearly all to do with, oh, there's been a violent attack, there's been a murder. I, I just find it really frustrating because as I said, I, I've met so many people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective who 
wouldn't they wouldn't hurt a fly literally wouldn't hurt a fly i can see how that must be frustrating mm. Mm. i think that is a movie trope as well because i think people have seen how that could have you know quite exciting movie potential mm. they've written that into enough movies over the decades and it's become the thing i know i understand i know mm. i think again hollywood needs a <laughs> a shift in the way that they portray mental health issues you know yeah well there was that film split do you see that <laughs> i didn't see that no oh. i know the one you mean i just no. It, it was ridiculous. Just really? <laughs> utterly ridiculous. And it was just like this guy was having like a hundred different voices or 30 different voices. And each one, he was becoming a different person every time and then going off and killing people. So oh. it's that kind of thing. Yeah. That's again, it's really frustrating. Really yeah. frustrating. Hollywood needs to do, needs to do better. M. Night Shyamalan, do better. Absolutely. <laughs> For sure. No, seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and what's an MBE? What is that? Oh, so, um, well, um, it's a bit dated, to be honest, because hmm. it, it stands for <laughs> member of the British Empire, which is really, right, right. really, really dated. And <laughs> I, I think okay. it really needs to... Aren't we all members of the British Empire? Yeah, a bit of the, <laughs> I mean, the British Empire, I mean, it's pretty controversial, isn't it? And uh, I do think that they need to change the... <laughs> the, the when someone gets an it's it's an award and when someone gets this award um i just i kind of wish they'd changed the the name of it yeah. a few people have turned it down because you know yeah. they just don't want to be associated with the british empire and i understand that but how would your parents have reacted if you turned down the mbe yeah i know <laughs> i know they would have yeah look i mean the whole thing was really um well it was it was it was so lovely to to receive this award and to go to the Buckingham Palace and did you meet the Queen? No, I had uh, it was Prince William that that gave me my MBE, which was um, well. The thing was, it was really lovely because I've met him a few times in the oh. work that I've been doing, and um, it was just we just had a really lovely chat, to be honest. Um, when he gave me the the medal, uh, and he's really passionate about mental health. He is, isn't he? Mm. Brilliant. Really passionate. It's brilliant. I've just seen in the Crown because they had a history that of covering up mental health in the, in the <laughs> royal family. So sure. good on him. Yeah. Oh, he's really and and Prince Harry and all of the young royals, to be honest, are really passionate about mental health oh. issues, which is great. And they really, it feels like something that they've really dedicated to, um, which is they've got such a huge influence. So that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, it really helps. 